the next two studies, we're going to be talking about really the power of God's Word. And tonight we're going to be discussing how to get more out of your Bible. This is a very common question for many of us. We want to draw closer to the Lord. We know that the scriptures are essential for us to do that. And we know that the Bible is the word of God. But how can I get more out of my Bible study, even in my perspective and my disposition toward the word of God? And so what I would like to emphasize this week is simply our understanding of the power of God's word. How do we get more out of it. Uh, it has been said that the dust on the Bible leads to the drought of the heart, and that is certainly true. As Christians, we must feed on the Word of God. In fact, the Word of God is described as, as our milk and our meat that we feast on. We know it is the revelation of who God really is and His mind and His heart. So if we don't feed on that milk and that meat, if we don't uh, allow uh, ourselves to be nourished on the Word of God, then we can't grow closer to Him. So our real connection of faith to Him uh, is really fed through the Word of God. I want to share a prayer with you uh, that I actually heard a brother pray one time about uh, the Word of God, and it struck me. He said, Heavenly Father, help us to overcome the cowardice that would prevent us from seeing the truth, uh, the laziness which would prevent us from believing uh, half-truth and the arrogance which would cause us to think that we need no truth lead us to accept all of your truth and that's really what we want to do and one of the great sections of scripture that emphasizes the very point we're going to be talking about tonight is psalms 119 now don't panic that is one big psalm about the word of god so we're not going to do a verse by verse this evening but I do want us to notice several sections in Psalms 119. So please be turning your Bibles there, Psalms 119. If I can get my uh, controller here, Psalms 119. And uh, we're just going to draw some points. We're going to begin in Psalms 119 in verse 89. We're going to skip around a little bit uh, in this book. Uh, but we, it's very important that we don't have a closed Bible that we have an open heart, that we have an open mind, and that we have an open Bible. And before we talk about really how to study the Word of God, or even what will happen in our lives if we study the Word of God, our perspective and our attitude must be one that will motivate us and encourage us to read from the Word of God, to study it, to think about it, to meditate on it. And I believe that that would be greatly helpful to us and so we're going to begin with the notion of appreciating the virtues of the Word of God. We're just going to talk about some very positive things we should already know, but we need to keep in mind regarding the nature of the Word of God and, and how it can affect our lives. And one of the first things we find out when we think about appreciating the virtues of the Word of God is this is a timeless book. You know, there are those who have the thought that, well, this is just such an old-fashioned piece of literature. I mean, it's ancient literature. It's out of date. How does it really apply to my life? And it's true that when we think about the Hebrew Scripture of the Old Testament, when we think about the New Testament, uh, that when that was written, uh, you're talking about, you know, a real long time ago. And even when Jesus lived on this earth and, and died and was resurrected, we're dealing with first century times. And when you think about when the church was established, again, that's a long time ago. But this is critical for us to understand regarding the Word of God. When you're talking about the needs of our soul, when you're talking about our need for a relationship with God and a relationship with Christ, culture will change. It seems like patterns go out and they come back in. Now, we see commonalities in all cultures and the development of culture and society. So a lot of even the societal challenges we face, they're not new challenges when you think about history. But even at that, culture may change, society may change, fashions may change, thinking can even change. But when we talk about the soul and the needs of the soul, we have the same need for God, for forgiveness. We have the same problem with sin 
And we need the same Savior as the people that first heard about Jesus on the day of Pentecost. We have the same needs that Cornelius had in Acts chapter 10. And this word, this Bible that we have addresses those things. And the Holy Spirit guided these men. It guided these men as they wrote. This was not just what they thought about it. It worked through them. And we are able to read from the prophets. We are able to read from the writings of Moses. We are able to, to read about Jesus and John the Baptist. We have the writings of the apostles and inspired men of God. And these things still deal with major issues. You think about our sexual ethic. You think about the nature of our marriages. You think about our homes and families and the things that would help us in a godless and wicked culture. Remember, these people also had to live through some very difficult times. And so this is a timeless book. In fact, Psalms 119 and verse 89. Psalms 119 and verse 89 says this. It says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. No, this word applies to us. It can change our lives now. In Psalms 119 and the 152nd verse, verse 152 of Psalms 119, the scripture says, of old I have known from your testimonies that you have founded them forever. In verse 116, we can find the same kinds of things said about God's word in the New Testament and throughout the word of God. But Psalms 119, verse 160, the sum of your word is truth and every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. You know, these are good verses maybe to write down on an index card and put somewhere where you're going to see it every day or to read in the morning before we go to work or before we go out and go about our normal day. Empires have fallen, civilizations have faded, kings have been conquered, unbelievers have perished, but the Bible is still here. And we have to recognize that the word of God has had tremendous enemies. More than one man, more than one society has tried to destroy the word of God, even some who claim to be very religious. But they've not been able to do so, nor will they ever be able to do so. All of the enemies of the word of God have been unable to dilute one sweet word of scripture with their ink of infidelity. It is a powerful revelation. God's word is indestructible. Peter would say in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 25 that God's word endures forever. And so he says exactly what the psalmist says. But you know, not only is this a, a timeless book, it is a truthful book. Now skeptics have tried to come along and they allege these contradictions. And when you really look into it, it's not very uncommon at all. In fact, it's pretty much universally true that uh, when they get into that kind of thing, they, they're not, it's not that they're going at it with an open mind. Now someone might have questions about those alleged contradictions. And we can talk about those things, but when somebody's decided, I don't want to believe in the Bible, there's all kinds of things they bring up that don't have anything to do with the message of the gospel or the message of the Bible. And many times, if not most of the time, it is a, a shallow understanding of what the Bible actually says. And let me just give you an example of that. Sometimes uh, those who are skeptical will bring up, well, you know, the Bible contradicts itself because... Some passages say Pharaoh hardened his own heart, and then these other passages contradict that and say that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. What we need to understand is that there's no contradiction there, but you have to read the whole of the message and the story about Pharaoh to appreciate what's going on. There's a sense in which God did harden Pharaoh's heart. And that is he hardened his heart, you know, when he actually showed mercy to Pharaoh, then Pharaoh would would actually harden his own heart, but it was through the means of God's mercy when God commanded Pharaoh to do a thing that Pharaoh had chosen he did not want to do. In that sense, God was hardening him through his commandment. It's not that he flipped a switch and made him harden his own heart, but it was through God's teaching, it was through God's command and his wishes that he was hardening his heart. But in another sense, Pharaoh made a free will choice to harden his own heart. Even today, the word of God can be preached and somebody can harden their heart, but in a sense, God hardened the heart through his word because of the condition of the heart. It's not something he did irresistibly. 
But it was through his gospel and through his word that somebody is rejecting that their heart was hardened. So there's no contradiction there. It is a truthful book. Psalms 119 and verse 142. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness. Listen, your law is truth. You think about living according to the word of God. Would we not be better off if we don't hate our brother or hate our neighbor or if we're more forgiving? Would our relationships, would our marriages, would our friendships, would um, our, our fellowship with other people not be better? Would we not have more harmony and peace? Would we not be better off if we, if we prayed more, if we were more committed to God's will? Of course we would. God's word is true. Psalms 119, verse 151, you are near, O Lord, and all your commandments are our truth. Verse 160, this, again, the sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. Jesus said that God's word was truth in John 17, 17. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes unto the Father but by me. And so you'll have some folks come along and say, well, you need to reexamine the Bible. It really is not inspired at all we need to go on our own experience no we need objective truth our experience may change from day to day and so whether it's a frontal attack by the skeptic or a rear attack from the modernist who says you can't trust it or a flank attack by believers who just don't like the teaching of the scripture anymore because they don't want to change the scripture is still inspired of god second timothy 3 16 and 17 says for all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God-breathed. So what we're reading here is God-breathed. It comes from the very revelation and mind of God through his inspired writers. And he says it's profitable for doctrine. That's teaching or instruction. He talks about reproof and rebuke and correction and the edification that we need that we may be thoroughly equipped uh, to be all that we would need to be. And you know, even when Christ was tempted by Satan, he quoted from Deuteronomy, which was uh, very old scripture even at that time. And yet, in the original, he says, it stands, the scripture stands. When he says, it is written, that means it, it stands true. God spoke through these inspired writers. But you know, not only do we have a timeless book and a truthful book, we also have a treasured book. It should be very significant to us. It should be valuable to us. You know, when we're going through difficulties, we need to hang on to God's word. When we have blessings in our lives and things are going well, sometimes we tend to forget about who God really is. But we need to listen to who he is in his word and understand who he is. And our knowledge of God's word is what will get us through those challenging times. Martyrs who were willing to give their lives for the word of God, treasured it, loved it, lived it, claimed it, and confessed it as they died. And so we would not know of Christ's love if it were not for his word. We would not know of the beauty and the power and the glory of God beyond the natural revelation of his creation if it were not for his word. We would not know about the events and the ministry of of Jesus and about his death and about God's love in his incarnate son and about the early church and how Christians worshiped and how they lived and what's important to God were it not for his word. And so that leads us to a, a second thought and that is this, we need to appreciate the virtues of the word of God to be sure, but we need to not only appreciate the virtues of God's word, we need to assimilate into our lives the vitality and the life of the word of God. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 says the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. But joints and marrow, what it means is the innermost part of your soul and your spirit. Jesus says, my words are spirit and they are life. Let's come back to Psalms 119 again and read several verses we need. And what will that look like? What does it look like to assimilate the vitality of God's word? It means I'm going to desire its instruction. I'm, so when I go to God's word, it's not I'm going to get this scripture reading over with and just move on. 
or I can check the box off now. No, I go to God's word with a hunger and a thirst for Christ and for what God wants. I want that instruction so I can live a life that will glorify him and be saved in eternity. And so I desire its instruction. What a change that will make in our Bible study. If you want to get more out of the Bible, first of all, we have to desire the instruction. Now, we all learn in some different ways, and God's Word will address that if we pursue it. But look at Psalms 119 and verse 12. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. And then he goes on in verse 18 he says, open my eyes that I may behold wonderful things from your law. In verse 70, he says in verse 70, their heart is covered with fat, but I delight in your law. What does it mean their heart is covered in fat? They're, they're just covered in this world and their own appetites, but he says, I get my vitality from your law. Verse 73, your hands made me and fashioned me. Give me understanding that I may learn your commandments. You know, some, even religious people, they don't want to hear about what God wants them to do, but David said, I want to learn more of your commandments. In verse, uh, and we mentioned that there in verse 73. But even going further, what else do we need to do? It's not just reading it. We need to read it and we need to meditate upon it. That means we need to think about it. So you read a section of scripture and you might just want to pause and think about it. What does it mean for my life? How will it make you a better father or a better mother, a better husband, a better wife? Uh, how will it help you on your job to glorify Christ? How will it help you in your family? How will it help you as a member of a local congregation to worship God faithfully and to encourage your brothers and sisters? Right now, we need to be really feeding on God's word. Look at Psalms 119 again. We're going to come back to verse 15. Psalms 119 Verse 15, I will meditate on your precepts and regard your ways. So it's not so much, you know, mass volume of Scripture in one reading. But when you read, stopping, listening to what God says in his word, meditating on it. Let's come to verse 147. Verse 147. In verse 147, he says, I rise before dawn and cry for help. I wait for your words. He says in 148, my eyes anticipate the night watches that I may meditate on your word. Now think about what he says. When I get up in the morning, I'm crying out to you for your instructions. And when I go to bed at night, I'm anticipating at night when I get to read your word. So as I'm going through my day, the activity of my day, I'm just thinking about when I'll be able to read your word. Where do we get God's instructions? Does he just whisper those in our ears? We're driving down the road. No. He has revealed those to us in his word. It is indeed powerful. And so there's some questions we could ask. You know, when I meditate, I say, well, what, do I, what questions do I ask for? What are some things I can do? So here's just some practical questions. When you're reading text of scripture, here's a question. You might say, you know, what do I learn about God here? Or what do I learn about Christ? Or what do I learn about how I need to live? But we could go further. We could say, you know, is there a promise in this text? Let's say you're reading uh, Ephesians 2, and you read that chapter, and it talks a lot about salvation by grace. Is there a promise here I need to think about? Uh, we could go on to say, is there a lesson here to need, uh, that I need to learn in order to be faithful to God? Is there a blessing talked about here that maybe I haven't appreciated and that God wants me to participate in and enjoy and as we continue to think about those questions, as we desire this instruction and meditate upon it, is there a command that I need to be obeying? Is there a command here? Is there a promise to enjoy? Is there a blessing I need to see? Is there a command to obey? Is there a sin this teaches me to avoid? Is there a new thought to carry with me? Maybe there's something I just hadn't thought about regarding the attributes of God and who God is and what that means uh, for my life. Uh, and as we assimilate the vitality of the Word of God, we need to understand how important it is to preserve this text. Look at Psalms 119 and verse 16. We need to hold on to it. So, Psalms 119, I believe it is, and uh, verse 16. Let's read this together. He says this, I shall delight in your statutes. I shall not forget your word. It needs to be preserved in my life. 
Let's go a little further. Uh, as we think about preserving it, I also want you to think about practicing it. You know, if, if we know a whole lot about God's Word, now I'm not minimizing the need to know God's Word, but you can be, you know, an extensive, thorough, very uh, well-developed and capable Bible student and not be a faithful Christian. And what I mean by that is you can know a lot about God and you can know a lot about Jesus without actually knowing God and knowing Jesus in a relationship with him. We can, we can be able to fill in the blank to a lot of questions, which, I, again, I'm not saying that's not important, but God meant for his word and the knowledge of his word to transform our lives and to change us and for us to practice it. And so let's think about that for a minute and let's notice just a few passages. Psalms 119, look at verse 1. Psalms 119 and verse 1. How blessed are those whose way is blameless. Notice that. Who walk in the law of the Lord. They walk in God's law. How blessed or blessed are those who observe his testimonies, who seek him with all of their heart. They also do no unrighteousness. You have ordained your precepts that we should keep them diligently. Did you see what he said? Why did God reveal his word? So that we would obey it. And so we would be blessed by it. Oh, that my ways may be established to keep your statutes. And not only that, we need to know God's word. We need to preserve it. It should be important to us. We need to strive to practice it. And when we fall short, we ask God for forgiveness. But we need to proclaim God's word. Notice here in, in verse 127 of Psalms 119. 127 says this, it says, therefore I love your commandments above gold, yes, above fine gold. He says in 172, let my tongue sing of your word for all your commandments are righteous. We come back to verse 46 of this same psalm, beautiful psalm it is, Psalms 119.46, I will also speak of your testimonies before kings and shall not be ashamed. Are we ashamed of God's word? There's a lot of pressure put on by this society for us to be ashamed of God's word, but he says, I'm not going to be ashamed. And then finally, so we need to appreciate the virtue of God's word. We need to assimilate the vitality or life of God's word into our, our actual living of our lives. And then let's, let's go to one more point, and that's this one. We need to appropriate the principles of the word of God. Verse 45, Psalms 119, he says, God's word is our source of victory. Where does our spiritual victory through Christ come? I mean, where do we see it and, and what principles help us to do that? And how does Christ shape us? It's by the Spirit's revelation of the word of God. It's our source of victory. It's our source of growth. It's our source of joy. It's our source of power. It is our source of guidance. And so you get all that from the Word of God, and when you don't feed on the Word of God and you don't meditate on the Word of God, then you miss out on victory and growth and joy and power and guidance. And if we ever needed that, we need it now. Let's pray together. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, this evening that we've had the time to uh, worship you in the study of your Word, and we thank you for all those who have uh, feasted on your word in their own personal Bible studies in this uh, difficult time. And we pray that you would continue to bless us, be with our families, be with our children, be with parents who are striving to make wise decisions, not only about uh, physical matters and social matters, but more importantly about spiritual matters. And pray that you would forgive us of our sins and help us to grow closer to you through your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.